Well, looky here, looky here. You know what time it is. It's time to fry some fish. This time with lasers. <laughs> Hi there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 491 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. What have I got cooked up for you this week? Well, we're talking about electrostatic multi-nozzle printing technology, industrial microfabrication, and lifelike lasers. So, my guest this week is Walter Braun, COO of Scrona, and we're talking about the biggest challenges facing the microfabrication industry today. Why Walter believes that the next wave of semiconductor innovation will rely on novel semiconductor packaging, and the details of Scrona's super cool multi nozzle printing technology. And a little later on, I also investigate some new self-organizing lasers built by a team of researchers from Imperial College London and University College London that could lead to new materials for sensing, computing, light sources, and displays. All right, without further ado, let's welcome Walter from Scrona. Hi, Walter. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello, Amelia, and uh, thank you for having me on your show today. Absolutely. Okay, so first off, for my audience who may not know, what is Scrona all about, and how did you guys come to be? Well, Scrona is uh, developing a digital printing technology comparable to modern inkjet, uh, but with a much higher resolution, with a much wider material compatibility. The technology is able to print not only color inks, but also functional materials like metals, uh, semiconductors, and insulators, and much more. And we can do this down to the nanometer range in terms of resolution. So I think you can call us a deep tech hardware company. Um, Scrona was founded already in 2014, maybe a little bit too early, as the founders would state today. It's a spin-off of ETH Zurich. ETH Zurich is one of the foremost leading universities in science and technology in Europe. And the three founders did research and application studies on the so-called electrohydrodynamic or EHD printing technology and soon realized that there is an enormous potential of this technology for microfabrication and other fields. Fantastic. Now, Walter, before we dig into the details, Let's talk about the challenges that surround specifically MEMS microfabrication technology. What are you seeing are the biggest challenges in this space? I would say when when we talk about microfabrication, we are not only considering MEMS and semiconductors, but we also include uh, displays and touch panels. Also, these products are being manufactured using microfabrication technologies. There has been certainly tremendous progress in the microfabrication of semiconductor chips, especially in the front end fabrication process where the individual transistors are being made. The mastering of extreme ultraviolet light has pushed the resolution of uh, photolithography systems down to the single digit nanometer range, which is pretty amazing. And this is certainly something where we cannot go with our technology where we don't want to go with our additive technology. But we believe that the next wave of semiconductor innovation to increase uh, device performance, energy efficiency, and things like this will strongly rely on novel IC packaging technologies. This trend has become known as more than more. There is a wide range of opportunities for electrostatic printing, such as our um, technology is offering in this field, ranging from wafer and chip marking, simple things, to bumping, via filling, and even for direct patterning of redistribution layers, Scrona's printing engine with our sub-micrometer resolution and line aspect ratios larger than 10 to 1 is an ideal and economic match for the potential to reduce capital expenditure by a factor of 10, and OPEX by a factor of five, compared to conventional photolithographic fabrication systems. Fantastic. Now, Walter, can you explain the difference between electrostatic inkjet and conventional piezo inkjet? 
Sure, you know, the, the most fundamental difference lies within the actual droplet actuation process. A conventional printhead um, creates a pushing force inside of the printhead using mostly piezo or thermal elements to create pressure wave that travel to the nozzle exit and push a droplet of ink out of that nozzle. This not only limits the smallest possible nozzle sizes, but also restricts droplets to be the same size as the nozzle itself. Now, Scrona's electrostatic printheads pull the liquids out of the nozzle using an electric force outside of the printhead. In this process, a pointed cone of material of ink, the so-called meniscus, is formed and outside of the nozzle. And by proper tuning of all parameters, only from the very tip of that meniscus, small droplets are being released. In addition to this superior resolution that comes from that physical circumstance, which is at least an order of magnitude better than conventional inkjet, electrostatic printheads have a wide material compatibility. We demonstrated printing of very thin fluids with a viscosity of 10 CPS to very thick kind of honey-like fluids with a viscosity of 10,000 CPS from the same printhead. This viscosity is about 100x higher or thicker, if you will, than what conventional inkjet printheads can process. So that's the fundamental difference. It's the resolution and it's the material compatibility that we can process. Fantastic. Now, you guys have a proprietary MEMS chip. Can you give me some details on that as well? Yes, that is actually the core of our print tech technology. Our founders realized very early that in order for the technology to be applied in real production, it had to be economical. And these economics can only be achieved by massively scaling the nozzle count per printhead. Single nozzle systems are good for research and development, for open defect repair tasks, where electrostatic printing actually is being used already in the industry today. The challenge which had not been solved so far was the integration of multiple electrostatic nozzles within a microfabricated MEMS chip. Scrona has combined experience of about 10 years in designing and microfabricating high resolution electrostatic nozzles in microfluidic MEMS chips. We have demonstrated nozzle distances of 50 micrometers, 50, 15 micrometers in X and Y direction. This extreme nozzle pitch would allow you to put 40,000 nozzles on the size of one square centimeters, just to give you an idea or something to imagine. Up to the end of last year, we fabricated those chips at IBM Research here in Rüschlikon, close to Zurich. But with the funding from our Series A round last year and the research grant from the federal government institution, we were able to set up our own clean room and microfabrication. We now perform about 90% of the manufacturing steps in our own microfluidic MEMS chips in our own clean room facilities. Our current R&D printheads, which are available to customers for use in our Scrona lab printer, features about 40 nozzles. We call them Gen 10, which refers to the double digit nozzle count. Our next generation, Gen 100, will feature ink recirculation, just like modern inkjet printheads and other proprietary technology to increase printing performance and stability. We expect to introduce those printheads in the second half of this year. So, Walter, can you give me some more details about your lab printer? And this lab printer is available for OEMs and equipment companies as well, right? That's correct. When we had our first printheads, uh, we realized that we needed a system to test these printheads and to drive and actuate them. So we had to design and, and manufacture such a tool by ourselves. And this printer was improved over time. And, and once the first technology scouts visited our application lab, there was an instant interest for this tool. These guys also were asking, well, can we have such a printer for our own application lab? So to make our own tests. So we configured what we call the Scrona lab printer with a vibration isolated and self-leveling granite platform, motorized optics, um, high resolution and high speed cameras, a transparent and heatable multi-zone vacuum chuck, and of course, high precision XY substrate stages with linear motors. Pretty cool piece of equipment. 
So this printer is not designed for manufacturing applications and mass production, but is a very suitable tool for high-level research institutes or corporate R&D labs. We have a small number of these systems sold and installed at customers. And as the inbound interest further increased, we licensed this tool to a German industrial equipment manufacturer called Notion Systems. So the tool is available at Notion Systems, which can be found on the internet, notion-systems.com or at scrona.com. So as I said, we consider the print heads as a platform technology, which can be applied to many different fields in microfabrication. It's a semiconductor market. It's a display market. If you look at these markets, you will see that it's very different equipment needed to manufacture a 300 millimeter silicon wafer compared to a tool that makes displays for televisions. Um, such tools have the size of a single family house. We are not in the business of developing such uh, different tools and equipment, but we want to focus on the printhead itself and collaborate with uh, dedicated machine manufacturers. And there is a lot of interest from different industries already in our printheads and in the application of the printheads in their respective technology fields. Fantastic. Walter, this has been super cool. Thank you so much for joining me. But before we go, how about a little off the cuff question? So since you haven't been on my show before, I'm going to send you my standard off the cuff. So, Walter, a lot of us can't have our favorite foods for one reason or another these days. The restaurant's closed. You need a passport to get there. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, what would you have? That would probably be a Mexican burrito. What would you have in your burrito? I would probably have it with beef and the usual vegetables, lots of avocado, lots of salsa, and of course, a Mexican beer. <laughs> there you go. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> well, Walter, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you again for having me. Have you heard about the first spontaneously self-organizing laser device that can also reconfigure when conditions change? So the idea behind this groundbreaking new research coming out of Imperial College London and University College London is to help develop smart photonic materials and that these new materials could mimic biological matter in that they would be responsive, adapt, self-heal, and have an inherent collective behavior. Whoa right? Okay, so to really understand these new laser devices, we should step back a second and ask ourselves, why did these researchers attempt such a feat? Co-lead author Professor Ricardo Spanesa from the Department of Physics at Imperial explains the push to create these kind of laser devices like this. He says, lasers, which power most of our technologies, are designed from crystalline materials to have precise and static properties. We asked ourselves if we could create a laser with the ability to blend structure and functionality, to reconfigure itself, and cooperate like biological materials do. Our laser system can reconfigure and cooperate, thus enabling a first step toward emulating the ever-evolving relationship between structure and functionality typical of living materials. So what makes these laser devices so special? We all know that lasers amplify light to produce a special form of light, right? Well, these self-assembling lasers actually consist of microparticles that are dispersed in the liquid with a high gain, with a high ability to amplify light. The cool part comes in when these microparticles group together. Then they have the ability to harness external energy to laze or produce laser light. Next, this team used an external laser to heat up Janus particle, which is a particle that has been coated on one side with light absorbing material, around which these microparticles have gathered. 
So the lasing part, which is created by these microparticles, can actually be turned on and off by altering the intensity of that external laser. And that external laser is also controlled by the size and density of the cluster. Even cooler, by heating up different Janus particles, this team also showed that these lasing clusters can also be transferred in space. These Janus particles have also been shown to collaborate. They can actually create new clusters that have properties that are beyond the addition of the first two clusters. And this can cause the clusters to have the ability to boost their lasing power and change their shape. So where are these laser devices headed from here? Co-lead author of the study, Dr. Giorgio Volpe from the Department of Chemistry at UCL, explains the trajectory like this. He says, Nowadays, lasers are used as a matter of course in medicine, telecommunications, and in industrial production. Embodying lasers with lifelike properties will enable the development of robust, autonomous, and durable next-generation materials and devices for sensing applications, non-conventional computing, novel light sources, and displays. So, what are the next steps for this research? Well, this team is next going to tackle improving the laser's autonomous behavior to render them more lifelike, and then work on a potential first application, next generation electronic inks for smart displays. So cool. So if you want even more information about this super exciting new research, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by, who would that be? Yeah, me. <laughs> and you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. Also, if you'd like further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of July 22nd, 2022, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>